Hello, everybody. Welcome. I hope you were blessed by our time of praise together. I hope that that opportunity gave you uh, some encouragement and the opportunity to open up your own mouth and your own heart and sing your praise to God right along uh, with our team. I want to welcome you if you're a part of the North County Church of Christ family. We're glad that you're connecting with your family in this way. But if you're not, we want you to know this is a place where you're always welcome. And if you have an interest in being part of this family, we'd love to talk with you about that. But you may be from the North County uh, community, maybe the larger San Diego community, maybe from another city or state altogether, or even another country. We want you to know that you're welcome, and if we can help you to draw closer to the heart of God, we want to do that. We'll give you a way uh, to, to let us know how we can help a little bit later in our time together. We're in a series that I'm uh, titling Confidence in Uncertain Times, and this is part two. So if you weren't with us last week, I'd encourage you at another time to listen to part one. We started out in Colossians 3, and we're going to focus our attention there again today as we think about how to have confidence in this time of uncertainty. Now, I mentioned last week, we are always living in uncertain times. James made it very clear that our life is but a mist that appears for a while and then, poof, vanishes away. And so we ought to always live saying, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that, because life is really in God's hands. So we always live with uncertainty, but we might say in this particular time we're living in, uncertainty abounds. So how do we live with confidence in a time of such uncertainty? And the first truth we've been looking at is out of Colossians chapter 3. If we're going to have confidence in this time of uncertainty, we need to keep our hearts and our minds in the right place. Back in 1939, the year that World War II broke out, C.S. Lewis was preaching a sermon in Oxford, England. And in that sermon, which was titled Learning in Wartime, he was talking about some of the lessons that we ought to learn during a crisis, like war, where lives were being lost right and left. Here's what he said in the sermon. War does something to death. And you might, by the way, want to hear this in a British accent. Maybe imagine, you know, Anthony Hopkins uh, saying this. I think he played C.S. Lewis in a movie. So, you know, hear this in Lewis's fine Brit British accent. He said, war does something to death. It forces us to remember it. War makes death real to us. And that would have been regarded as one of its blessings by most of the Christians of the past. They thought it good for us to always be aware of our mortality. Then he went on to say, I am inclined to think they were right. All the animal life in us, all the schemes of happiness that centered in this world were always doomed to final frustration. In ordinary times... Only a wise man could realize it. Now, we see unmistakably the sort of universe in which we have all along been living and must come to terms with. If we had foolish, unchristian hopes about human culture, they are now shattered. If we thought we were building up a heaven on earth, if we looked for something that would turn the present world from a place of pilgrimage into a permanent city satisfying the soul of man, we are disillusioned, and not a moment too soon. I think Lewis's words are very relevant in the time we're living in. Global pandemics with reminders of sickness and death have a way, I'd say, of focusing us on the things that matter most. And a time like this, like the time that Lewis was describing, makes death real to us in a way that war does also. So I want you to think about that phrase that Lewis made in the sermon. If we looked for something that would turn the present world from a place of pilgrimage into a permanent city satisfying the soul of man, we are disillusioned and not a moment too soon. I think among the reasons that there is so much anxiety, so much depression, and stress in our culture 
is that many of us have too high of expectations of what this sinful, broken, and fallen world can ultimately provide. This place for us, which is for those of us who are believers, a place, a place of pilgrimage, it's a place that's often treated even by Christians as if it's expected in reality to be a permanent city satisfying the soul of man. I mean, how many of us who are believers have put too much of our hope in the things of this world and we're depressed because at the end of the day, the things here don't ultimately satisfy. They disappoint. They always come up short. The hope that we have in things here is frustrated. We're living, often, as if this is the permanent city that should satisfy our souls, and we get so surprised when we're disappointed in what this life offers. The reality for the believer is, however, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2 at verse 11, the reality is that we are aliens and strangers in this world. Some of the translations read pilgrims in this world. We're living in this world, but our ultimate destiny is not here. It's heaven. Do you remember what the Hebrew writer said of Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11? The writer there said, by faith, Abraham, he left the place that was his home. It was a place of comfort. It was a place of familiarity. It was a place of great prosperity for Abraham. And he went to the promised land and lived there in a tent. And the writer says in Hebrews 11, he lived like a stranger in a foreign country. Then as you get down to verse 10, as the writer continues, he says about Abraham, he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. You see, Abraham was called from the place he was to go to a place that God had promised him, and he didn't possess it, his descendants would, but he lived there like a pilgrim, like a stranger. And yet he lived looking forward to something else, to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. That's not even a reference to the promised land that his descendants would inherit. That would be his eternal home. Then down at verse 25, it says that Moses was a man who chose mistreatment with God's people rather than enjoying the temporary pleasures of sin for just a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of far greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Why? Why did Moses, who had grown up with the wealth and prosperity of being the child of a pharaoh, adopted as he might have been, with all access to all the pleasures that Egypt had to offer, why did he forsake all of that and consider suffering with his own people better? Well, as you read in the text, the writer goes on to say, because he was looking ahead to his reward. So both of these, Moses and Abraham, they were looking ahead. Their focus was on something beyond this world. They lived in this world. They were useful in this world. They served the purposes of God in this world, but their eyes were off in eternity in that permanent home that God had for them. They, they had what? Paul refers to in Colossians chapter 3, this attitude of setting their hearts and setting their minds on things above. So this series, Confidence in Uncertain Times, one of the ways that we maintain confidence at a time of uncertainty is to maintain our focus, to keep our eyes, to keep our hearts on the right things. We live here and our faith determines the way that we live here. We're aliens and strangers here, and we're looking ahead as Abraham and Moses and other people of faith have. So last Sunday, we carefully considered Paul's writings in Colossians chapter 3. He goes back to chapter 2. He reminds them of their baptism when they were buried and raised with Christ. And he says in Colossians 3 at verses 1 and 2, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. 
Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind or minds on things above, not on earthly things. If you have ever moved to a new city or state, maybe even a whole different country, you know how it often takes a while to kind of get settled in and for that new place to begin to feel like home. That's especially true if you have a lifetime in another place. Brian Larson, who preaches in Chicago, told the story of pulling up to a stop sign in that city of Chicago, and there was a car in front of him, and mounted on that car was a uh, spare tire that had a cover on it, and on the cover was a picture of a Texas Longhorn. And the trailer hitch had an emblem of a Texas Longhorn. And in bold letters across the cover of that spare tire cover, it said, Texas. And then he looked at the license plate, and bordering the license plate was a frame that said, Texas Longhorns, and University of Texas on the bottom. Now, I lived in Austin, Texas for a number of years, and I know the loyalty of UT football fans, so I understand what that particular person was doing. Larson surmised, here is a family that has lived here long enough to have Illinois license plates, but it's clear where their home and their heart is. I think that's a good illustration for our spiritual life because it's often a slow transition before a new city or state or place might start to feel like home, and it takes a while for a new place to really get a hold of our hearts. And so it is with those of us who are Christians. We may have lived in that old country for a long time, and we enter the kingdom of God, and we take on heavenly citizenship, but the kingdom of this world doesn't immediately leave our hearts completely or quickly. And so we need this reminder that Paul gives us in Colossians chapter 3. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. Because the things of this world can feel so familiar and so comfortable that we can get our focus more on things here. I want to talk to you about one of the Psalms. Asaph wrote some of the Psalms. And while David is probably the most familiar writer of the Psalms, Asaph was one of those as well, and he wrote the 73rd Psalm. And when he writes that Psalm, he's describing a time when he is envious and jealous of evil people who have no regard for God. And he's embittered at the beginning of the Psalm as he thinks about the ways they prosper and make lots of money and live these healthy, robust lives while being prideful and evil. They seem carefree and they seem to make plenty of money and just have a big old time living here on earth, ignoring God, even being hostile to God while he's trying to live a godly life and he suffers. And so it causes him in the 73rd Psalm to say, Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. I mean, I've been living for you, God, and I've got difficulties in my life, and I'm looking around at evil people who just seem to have it all, and I think to myself, maybe, maybe I have served you in vain. Maybe it's been for no good reason. In other words, Asaph was wondering, hey, why do I have all these troubles and evil people just seem to get ahead and go places. As a matter of fact, in the psalm, he said some people are saying, does God even know? In other words, is he even aware of how some of these evil people are getting ahead in life? Does God see what I'm seeing? That is Asaph's question. So the psalmist is all stressed out. What's the point of serving God if he's going to let people get ahead and get away with things that are wrong? And, and then... He says at verse 21 that his heart was grieved and his spirit embittered. But then his perspective changes dramatically. He realizes something awakens in him, something that he knows, truth that is real, that's solid. God is everything. He says, really, God is my portion. 
And for those who are far from God, he goes on to say, hey, one day it'll all be over. They'll perish. And what they're living for will ultimately be destroyed. So he begins to wonder about himself. Why am I so worried that people are having such a good time with things that won't last? People who will ultimately perish. And then he says it is good to be near to God. And he says at verse 25 of that psalm, Whom have I have in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. Asaph's 73rd Psalm is a good reminder that it's easy to get our eyes focused on things here, to have our minds, as Paul said, on earthly things and to see things through a kind of worldly lens. It can be disheartening. It can be discouraging. And sometimes we, like Asaph, need to refocus our eyes on the things that are eternal, the things that are lasting, the things that matter most, the values that are deep and rich that are a part of being in the kingdom of God. You see, the uncertainty we experience here reminds us that we're pilgrims here. That as Lewis said, that this isn't our permanent city. We live here, but we're like Moses and Abraham. We're to keep our eyes focused up ahead. And that will make us more useful here, more fruitful here. Uh, more able to serve the purposes that God has for us here. There was a man back in the 1980s by the name of Mirhan Karimi Nasiri. He was a man truly without a country. For 11 years, if you can imagine this, he lived in the Paris airport. Yes, you heard that right. He had no passport. He had no citizenship. He no, had no papers that enabled him to leave the airport or fly to another country. He'd been expelled from his native country, Iran. Then he was sent to Paris, France. He lacked documentation, so there he was in Paris. And then he said uh, his Belgian-issued refugee document had been stolen, and so he couldn't enter Paris. So he flew to England, but he was denied entry into England, and he was sent back to Paris. And when he was returned to the Paris airport in 1988, airport authorities allowed him to live in Terminal 1. They wouldn't let him enter the country. And so there he stayed, living in Terminal 1 for 11 years, writing in his diary, living off the handouts of airport employees, cleaning himself up, in the airport restrooms and eating airport food. Then, in September of 1999, the situation reversed. French authorities presented him with an international travel card and a French residency permit, and suddenly he was free to go anywhere he wanted. But here's the amazing thing. When the airport officials handed him his walking papers, to everyone's surprise, he simply smiled, tucked the documents into his folder, and went back to writing in his diary at the table. He'd been in that airport so long, he was afraid to leave that bench and that table that was so familiar, that had been his home for 11 years. And as the days passed and Nasseri refused to leave, airport officials finally realized that they couldn't throw him out of the airport. That would not be compassionate, but what they realized they had to do was gently and patiently coax him to find a new home. Can you imagine a more unnatural home than an airport? I mean, it's bustling, it's interesting, I'm sure, to watch people, but it's no home. It's a place that you just pass through on your way to another place. When we come to Christ, we have a move to make that for some might be as frightening as the move Merhan had to make from that airport. We are called away from the familiar, unnatural home of the ways of this fallen, broken world to a new home, to the new ways of the kingdom of God. And yet that home, that new place is so much better in every way. If we're going to live with confidence here, 
We have to do as the psalmist Asaph did. We have to do as Abraham and Moses did. We must do what Paul calls us to do here. We must regain our perspective and set our hearts there and set our minds there. We're to stay, stay so focused on our relationship to Christ that it defines everything else. I want to talk about two aspects of our relationship with Christ. And again, if you're watching this and maybe you're searching and all of this is kind of new, I want you to know that what I'm describing here as far as a Christian's relationship to Christ is something that you can have. You can have this very relationship. But let's think about that relationship. First, as Paul urges us to kind of keep our hearts and minds on things above, he describes your connection to Christ and my connection to Christ. Notice what he says. In verse 1, he said, since you've been raised with Christ. At verse 3, he says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Well, that's, that's wonderful language here. Your life is now hidden hidden with Christ in God. This phrase, it is a, a phrase of unity and connection. Christ died on the cross to cleanse you of all your sins. He was put in the tomb and he was raised from death, raised from that grave on the third day. And as you go back to chapter two, Paul says, you too died to your old life of sin. You were buried with him and you were raised to this brand new life, not just a better version of your old life. You were raised to a new life. The old life is gone. Jesus now covers your sins. He makes you a brand new creation. When God sees you, he sees Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ in God, and you have been united with him in such a way that the benefits of his righteous life are now given to you. It's as if you lived a righteous life, not a sinful life. And his death on the cross, the death he died, is for you. It cleansed you of your sin, and as a result, you gained his righteousness. And now Paul says, Christ is your life. He's your life. That's the language Paul uses. And when he appears, when he comes again, you'll appear with him, Paul says, in glory. So we have been united with the very one who conquered sin and death for us, and now when God sees us, our life is hidden. He sees Jesus. We get the benefits of his righteous life. And now, Paul says, Christ is your life. This is so important. God didn't save us just to make us good churchgoers who show up for an hour and a half and sit in a sanctuary on a Sunday and sing some hymns and then go off and live our lives as we were living before we became a Christian. He didn't die just to make us churchgoers. He died to give us new life, to make everything new. And Christ now is is our life. He is our life. And he wants Christ to live in each of us. This is why Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 at verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me the life that I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, I was crucified to that old life, and it's no longer me, but Christ living in me. So let me ask you this question today, believer. Is that a good summary of how you see your life now? I know of people of whom it can be said, hey, their life is their job. Hey, football is my life, somebody might say. Somebody else might say, my family is my life, or partying is my life, or hey, riding dune buggies in the desert, that's my life, or, or surfing, you know, that's my life. Your life is going to be something. Your life is the thing that has a hold on you. It is the thing that you're passionate about. It's the thing that shapes your desires. It's the thing that has a hold on you. So Paul says Christ is your life. And in Christ, 
Christ isn't just a part of an already full life. He is our life. He is the source of our new life. He is the source of our salvation. He is the one who has taken hold of our heart and our mind. So there is this connection that we have in Christ that is real, and by grace it is given to us as a gift. There's a reality to that connection. And whether we're recognizing it right now or not, if you're a believer and you're in Christ and your heart's not there and your mind's not there, it's a reality. But you need more than the reality. You need a daily recognition of that reality and you need to live in to that reality. We need to live it out by recentering our lives on Jesus Christ if that's not where we've been living. One day Martin Luther was answering a knock at the door of his house and the person outside asked, does Martin Luther live here? Luther said, no, he died. Christ lives here. Our connection to Christ is such that when people encounter us increasingly, they are beginning to see more and more of Christ likeness in us, more and more of Jesus in us. That's the hope. That's the goal. And the more our hearts and minds are there, the more it's going to translate into our life here. So, if anything of this world is your life, then your life has quite likely been shaken by all that has happened this year. But if Christ is your life, then the foundation of your life, the purpose of your life, the direction of your life is as fixed as it ever was. Charles Spurgeon once said, I suppose that if you were to meet your old self, he would surely hardly know you for you are so greatly changed. Isn't that an interesting idea? So Paul describes this connection that we have with Christ. Christ is our life. And then he describes, number two, Christ's commitment to you and to me. There in Colossians chapter 3 at verse 4, he said, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Back in Philippians chapter 3, a passage I referenced some weeks ago, Paul speaks about our heavenly citizenship, and he describes how in verse 21, Christ, when he comes again, will transform our lowly body so that we will be like his glorious body. The work that Christ started in your life way back when you became a Christian, or maybe it isn't way back, maybe it's more recent than that, that work he is still performing as he makes you more and more like him each day. But one day when he appears a second time, our lowly bodies, these earthly bodies, will be made like his glorious resurrection body. That is his commitment to you and to me. He has this. And so he's asking us to live here with our hearts and our minds in the right place. John Ortberg's book, Faith and Doubt, points to the difference between hoping for something and hoping in someone. Hoping for something means hoping for a particular outcome, a job, a house, a cure. All of those earthly hopes, they ultimately disappoint us. They wear out, they fall apart, they melt away, or maybe they never even materialize. So is there a deeper hope? Is there someone that we can put our trust in who never disappoints, who is always faithful? The Bible answers yes to that question, and that person is Jesus. He is the one who is worth trusting. Every promise he's made has always come true. Paul goes on in this letter to give some direct instruction about how now we should live, now that we're a believer, As you read at verses 5 to 11, and we won't, but I'd encourage you to read this, he talks about the old life that you put off, those old ways of living that have to do with the old nature. And then he describes, down at verses 12 to 14, this new life that we're to put on. It's as if he's saying, put off those old grave clothes of death, those old sins that were so damaging and destructive, and put on this new life, and he describes the attributes then, of that new life in contrast to those old sins. And then this section at verse 15 reminds us that we're to then let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. I'd encourage you to read 
verses 5 down to verse 14. But let me, let me conclude with this. Paul in this section says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. We can have peace. Peace in uncertain times, confidence, if we trust, if we let Christ have our lives and make him our life and keep our hearts and our minds on things above and then live accordingly. We'll come back next week and we'll continue this series. There's much more to it on confidence in uncertain times. I hope this message has blessed you. Now, if you're watching this and I said earlier, uh, maybe you're interested in taking a step in the direction of God or getting to know him more or knowing more about his plan for your life, knowing how to relation, have a relationship with Christ or to be saved, to have your own sins cleansed or forgiven. We'd love to help you to know how. Just send us a message at info at northcountycfc.org. Info at northcountycfc.org. And let us know how we can help you spiritually. Have a great day today and may God bless you this week. I hope you'll be back with us next Sunday morning. Stick around uh, for a few more words.